good evening, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Risa Wexler. I'm the director of KIPAC, which is the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, a bit of a mouthful. Um, but what that means is that we basically study everything in our universe. Um, I guess, actually, probably the smallest thing we study is the atmospheres of extrasolar planets. And the biggest thing we study is the entire universe. Um, so we have a lot of fun. And um, we also try to uh, share some of that fun with, with the public. And I'm really, really thrilled today that we have uh, Joe Dunkley to tell us about many aspects of our universe. Um, so Joe is a, an extremely accomplished cosmologist. She's a professor at Princeton University. She uh, did her PhD at Oxford and then um, went back and forth between Oxford and Princeton. She did a postdoc at Princeton and then was faculty at Oxford before returning to Princeton a few years ago. And um, she has done many, many interesting things in cosmology. Uh, a lot of those have been focused on essentially understanding the entire universe. Um, including the clues that we can learn about the universe from the light emitted just a frac tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, which I'm sure you'll hear about today. No? OK. Well, that's where she's made a lot of her uh, most, most incredible contributions, <laughs> including a very long list of prizes. She twice won the, the Gruber Prize for her work on uh, the WMAP satellite, which uh, very precisely measured uh, the cosmic microwave background, and then about 10 years later, the, uh, the next satellite, the Planck satellite, uh, which measured it even more precisely. Uh, but that's not the only thing uh, she's, she's done, and today, we, this morning, we heard a really interesting talk about how future measurements <coughs> in that area are going to teach us about this very interesting particle, the neutrino. Um, and she's also worked on many other topics. So um, it's, it's a great pleasure to have her. I'm even more excited because she's written this really lovely book that was just published about a month ago called Our Universe. Um, and it's a really beautiful whirlwind tour of, of everything. And I think we're going to get a little flavor <laughs> of that tonight. So welcome, Joe. <laughs> Thanks so much, Risa, and yeah, thanks for having me here. Um, it is, it's such a pleasure to be able to tell you about the universe and why I find it so exciting. Um, but it is certainly true that even though I'm visiting here and talking about it, you are in a place full of experts about the universe. So after you know, you've been here this evening, you can come back and talk to all the people here who learn about the universe, <laughs> okay? So, um, Okay, so why, why do I find it so compelling? And, and why should you care as well? So I find it so compelling because we, this bigger universe, it's our bigger home. You know, we are here on Earth and we are part of something so much bigger. And, and if we can get to know that bigger thing, then I think it really enriches our lives to understand this much bigger home that we're part of. Just like if you, you know, were to live on Earth and not know what was over the other side of the world and who was over there, um, you, you would, you know, your experience might be less rich than getting to know something over there. So I feel like getting to know our bigger home um, enriches us. And it's our bigger story, right? Why are we here on Earth right now um, in our part of the universe? How did we come to be here? What is the story, the longer story that got us to be here on a planet in our solar system, um, uh, right, you know, right here, right now. Um, <coughs> so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with, you know, our, our bigger home. What is, what is our home? And that's also where I start um, in my book as well, trying to say, let's, let's, let's just take steps outwards and think about what it is we're part of and how we have come to know what is this bigger thing we're part of. Um, so, of course, the first thing we're, that we're part of in our universe is our solar system. You know, our, our eight planets plus a bunch of rocks zooming around our wonderful sun at the middle, the gravity of it pulling us into orbit around it. And something I find extraordinary is just even how big that is. You know, it's, it's about three billion miles out from the sun 
out to Neptune. Um, pretty long way. Um, <laughs> and that's going to be one of the smallest things we think about in the universe. Um, and, and it's also amazing how completely empty our solar system is. We think of it as these kind of big planets and the, and the sun. But if you were to imagine putting the solar system into this hole that we're now, imagine putting the sun at the middle and the planets orbiting around it. If Neptune was kind of orbiting around the edge of this room, the sun would be just the size of a peppercorn, just a couple of millimeters across in the middle. And the Earth would be a speck. You couldn't see it, it was so small, a speck of dust orbiting around that. And the rest of this whole space would basically be almost completely empty. So space is, space is big and it's, and it's not got that much in it. <laughs> um, but the stuff that's in it is pretty cool. Um, and, and so um, it's a big place, the solar system, but it's something that we can actually go and explore. We can send probes out to the far reaches of the solar system. We can take pictures of Pluto. We can send things out even though they're billions of miles. Um, and, and in thinking about the scale of how big this is, um, we often like to, as astronomers, think about how long it takes light to travel across a bit of space, how long it takes us take it to reach us. And, and just with our solar system, um, it takes light a few hours to get out from the sun out to Neptune, if this again was our space that we're in, a few hours. And that's light, that's the fastest thing in the universe. It's, it travels at getting on for a billion miles an hour, zipping along as fast as you know you possibly can travel, and it takes it a few hours to cross our solar system. Now that's our nearby bit of home, but if we now take a step out, um, then the next thing out that gets, we get to, get to are the stars, the beautiful stars twinkling in the night sky around us. Now to get out to there, it's a much bigger step outwards than just our you know, ginormous solar system. Um, <coughs> and um, um, I'll come back to what this, this band of light is and the twinkling stars are. But to get out to the stars, um, it's a huge step out. Even the nearest star to us in the night sky, the light takes four years to reach us. So whatever age you are now, subtract four, um, if you're more than four years old. Um, and, and, and that age is how old you were when the light from the very closest star to us set off on its journey to us. And we're just seeing it right now. And most of the stars in the night sky, the light's been traveling for longer than that, tens of years, hundreds of years. The, the stars in Orion's belt, their, their light set off to us about a thousand years ago. Just been traveling, traveling through space to reach us. And what that means is that, um, is that this is so much further that even the stars are not places that we can imagine going to. If we want to get out to the stars and out beyond, we have to just look. I mean, of course, we can have wonderful ideas about traveling out to the stars, but really, this is so far away that we can just look out and, 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 and see it from here, from our, our vantage point here on Earth. But how do we know how far the stars are? Because, um, you know, that's one of the wonderful challenges of doing astronomy as you can all we can do is sit here on earth and try to piece together how what things how things what things are happening out in space we can't go there so if we want to measure a distance to a place we have to figure out how to do that um, how do we just sit here on earth and figure out where things are so to figure out where the stars are we use this neat method called parallax and I can use parallax to actually measure the length of my arm if I didn't really feel like measuring the length of my arm. Okay, and I'll show you how. If I hold my arm out, actually, and you're gonna do it too, okay? Everyone hold their arm out. <laughs> okay, and, and close one eye and see where your finger appears on the wall behind it, okay? And then close the other eye. Does it move? Good, okay. Now, imagine I have a really short arm. Pull your arm closer to your face and do it again. What happens? Moves more. Good. Moves more. Yeah. Okay. That's parallax. Okay. So the more, the, the longer your arm is, the less it moves when you close each eye. Okay. And the shorter your arm is, the more it moves. And so I can actually just use that fact and I can use the right angle triangle trigonometry that many of you will have learned at school that says if I only know the distance between my two eyes and I know how much my finger moved when I did that thing. 
I can just use a right angle triangle to work out the length of my arm. And that's a bit of fun. I don't really need to, right? <laughs> just take a measuring tape and measure the length of my arm. But this becomes fundamental if I want to know how far away the stars are. Because for astronomers, we use this same parallax, parallax method to now figure out where the, nearest, where, the, where the stars are. So if I imagine the star to be my fi outstretched finger, my two eyes are the Earth six months apart as it goes around the sun. So what I do is I close one eye by looking at the star from the Earth at one point of the year, and I see where the star appears against a backdrop of more distant stars. And then I close the other eye by, by making the same measurement six months later. And the star has apparently moved against the backdrop. And the more it's moved, the closer it is to me. And so all I need to know then is the distance between my two eyes, which is the distance um, between the Earth, or the distance between my eye and my nose, is the distance between the Earth and the sun. OK? <laughs> um, know that already. That's, that, that's, an, that's another story that I write about in my book, actually. Uh, it's a wonderful story. Um, and, and then you can do it. You can figure out this, 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 this distance. And that was done back in the 1800s. Now, people had figured out that you could do this, but the amount that the, even the most close stars to us move against the sky, the amount of this parallax shift, is so tiny that you actually need rather good telescopes to be able to um, see this very small shift. So it took until the 1800s for the very first measurements um, to, to be made. But you know, sure enough, they were done, and people really realized that, oh, goodness me, the stars really are a long way away. Um, and so we're surrounded by nearby stars, and we see in the night sky these beautiful twinkling, twinkling stars around us. But they are actually, again, part of something much bigger. The next thing that we're part of is this wonderful place called our Milky Way galaxy. So we are living in this huge disk of stars, um, about 100 billion stars pulled together um, by the force of gravity of all of the stars in that galaxy that pulls them in. And, and when we, and actually, if you are, if you are lucky, <laughs> you could see the fact that we live in the gal this galaxy of stars by seeing this band of light on the night sky that, that probably most people don't get to see regularly, but some, if you go to the right kind of location on a really dark night in a really um, low light pollution area, you can actually see this band of light. Okay. <coughs> and, 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 and what is it? So, so we live, so, so we think that, this, that it's, this, it's, this, it's this swirling disk of stars, and, and we're living in our Milky Way, in our solar system, in the disk of stars. And I was just saying to Teresa, I, I, if, if this were closer to my home, I meant to bring a large saucepan lid, uh, but I live in New Jersey, so I've got a paper plate, okay? <laughs> so, um, not that that's because I live in New Jersey, because I couldn't bring my saucepan lid to, to, um, to Stanford. Okay, so um, we, we are living in this disk of stars, and imagine that you are uh, embedded in the solar system in this paper plate, okay? Um, and we think we're somewhere sort of halfway out from the middle out to the edge. Now imagine that you're living in a disk of stars. What do you see from within that disk of stars? Well, if you're living in it, then if you're living in it and you look straight through the disk, then as you look through this disk of stars, you would see a band of light where that disk, where, when you're looking straight through the disk. And again, you'd see the same thing if you look straight out through the disk this way. But if you were to turn your head and look out this way, where you're not seeing through that disk of stars. You wouldn't see very, very much, not many. And out this way again, not very many stars at all. So this band of light that we can sometimes see in the sky, if we're very lucky, is us just looking straight through the disk of this Milky Way galaxy, this disk of, of 100 billion stars collected into this beautiful place. Um, but how do we know, you know how, how big that is and where it is? Because again, one of the challenges is to try and, as astronomers, we have this kind of two-dimensional sky around us. We, see, we sort of see this around us, or we see other images around us. And we're trying to turn it into a three-dimensional picture of the whole of, whole of space. 
And so we have to try and unwrap it and say, well, what's actually, what, is it, what would it look like if I were to be able to, to, to look at it from, from afar? So, so how do we know what's, what, how, even how big this, 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 this galaxy is? Um, it turns out that this parallax method of seeing how much stars move only take us so far. It actually can't take us to the farther reaches of our Milky Way. Um, and so um, about 100 years ago, astronomers were trying to figure out how to get further. How do we step further out? And now, again, that's hard because you can't go there and measure stuff. Um, if all stars were the same as bright as... If all the stars were the same in the night sky, we could actually just use their brightness to figure out how far away things are. Imagine you could hold a 100-watt light bulb uh, and you knew it was 100 watts. <laughs> then just by measuring how bright or dim it was, you could tell where it was. You know, if it's very far away from you, then it looks very dim. If it's very close, it's going to look really bright. Um, <coughs> but, um, and so that, that was sort of early ideas said, OK, let's use this to figure out where things are. But it turns out that stars these big balls of gas burning um, gas in their cores and sending out this beautiful light, they're not all the same brightness. Uh, they have different sizes, different, different, different amounts of, of gas burning brightly, and so they're actually not all the same brightness. So we can't just use how bright they are to figure out where they are. Um, but 100 years ago, this um, impressive woman, and Henrietta Swan Levitt, figured out a way to tell where distant stars were in the universe. Um, and, and she is, was part of this incredible group of um, women astronomers working at the turn of the last century at the Harvard College Observatory. And they were called the Harvard Computers, where computer is not, not this, right? <laughs> computer is, you know, uh, a thing that you do with, with your brain. A um, uh, hundred years ago, if you were a woman astronomer, you absolutely could not operate a telescope. No way, that was you know, not possible. What you were allowed to do was go and sit in a, in a, in a room and, and study um, photographic plates of stars. And, and, you, and you also weren't allowed to be paid very much for the privilege of doing that. <laughs> so, um, so Edward Pickering, um, an astronomer, realized that he could actually hire this like, very um, talented group of women to study painstakingly many, many, many images of, of stars taken you know, at the turn, the turn of the last century from telescopes, um, both in North America and also down in locations like Peru, where you could actually go and look at, see things from the southern hemisphere. And, and so she, she actually started working at, this, at the Harvard College Observatory after having done her degree, finished her degree there, she actually became deaf after doing her degree and sort of drawn to this work where she was studying these photographic plates of stars very, very carefully. And her job was to basically look at, measure the brightnesses, the colours of stars. And in particular, she was tasked with looking at these stars that vary their brightness over time. That if you go and look at a star again, um, if you go and look at a star over weeks or months, it'll change its brightness. It'll pulsate, getting growing dimmer, brighter, dimmer, brighter over time. And they're called these um, Cepheid variable stars. Um, they're stars. They're stars much bigger than our sun. They've kind of reached the end of their lives. They've burnt up the fuel inside. They've become rather large. And over the course of days or weeks or months, they pulsate in size. And as they pulsate, they uh, pulsate in brightness as well. And, and Henrietta Swan Levitt figured out this incredibly important pattern about these stars. She figured out that um, the longer these stars took to pulsate, the brighter intrinsically they were. It's a very simple pattern. It's now known as Levitt's law. Um, and so a star that took uh, you know, months to pulse in brightness was brighter than one that took just days or weeks. And this was incredibly important. Because as we were thinking, as an astronomer, you've got to think about which measurements are easy to do, right? I said measuring, measuring you know, motion, sideways motion, that's OK. Um, and measuring the, how long a star takes to pulse in brightness is also doable. You just go and look at it for days or weeks or months, and you just see how long it takes to pulse. And doing that and seeing how bright these pulsing stars appear to us, you can then work out how far away they are. 
Um, so this was the key to measuring very distant parts of space and seeing how far away things were. And so she, using this discovery, um, astronomers could then go and look at these distant pulsing stars in our galaxy, and they figured out how big it was. They figured out that it was about 100,000 light years across. Which is, okay, this is big, right? We said that our solar system, it takes hours for light, the fastest thing in the world, to travel across, just hours. It takes then a few years to get out to the stars around us. It takes 100,000 years to cross our Milky Way galaxy. It's a big place. And so the astronomers were able to figure this out. And, and, and this is not a real image of our Milky Way galaxy because we can never take an image of our Milky Way. We can never take a picture of our galaxy because it's so big, we can't climb outside it and look back inside. Um, but this is what we think that it probably looks like. Um, uh, this is an, you know, an artist impression where we think that this is, and again, holding my paper plate, right? <laughs> this thing is like this, a disc, with these spiraling arms of stars spiraling into this central um, uh, bulge of stars at the, at the core. Um, and we think that the Earth is, the solar system is in one of these spiral arms of stars about halfway out from the middle to the edge. And the whole thing is spinning. And the whole thing spins around every 200 million years or so. So right now, in our little solar system, we are actually zipping around the Milky Way <laughs> really quite fast, but we don't feel it because we're kept in our, in our, in our solar system. OK, so this uh, Levitt's discovery took astronomers out to the far reaches of our galaxy. But it also took us further. So 100 years ago, astronomers thought that this, this galaxy we lived in, this collection of stars, that that was the whole of the universe. That was it. Um, but there was this kind of mystery, which was that astronomers had seen these smudges of light in the sky all around, all over sort of different, different parts of, of the night sky, smudges of light that um, they couldn't really identify what they were. They didn't really look like stars, but they, they couldn't figure out what they were. Um, and so this guy, Edwin Hubble, um, you took Levitt's discovery of this pattern of these, these pulsating stars and figured out what was going on. Now, it's pretty hard to find a picture of Hubble without this pipe in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure he'd be smoking it still today. But um, he was this, you know, well, well known, right? You all know, you've all heard of Hubble. Like, he's probably one of the most famous astronomers. Um, and he was working in, um, in California in, in, um, um, back 100 years ago, um, taking beautiful measurements from um, uh, telescopes and looking at these smudges of light. And in the smudge, one of the smudges of light, he found one of these pulsing stars one of these Cepheids. And armed with the understanding of like, how you can turn the rate at which they pulse into their distance, he figured out something astonishing, which was this smudge of light was not just a smudge of light inside our Milky Way. It was many, many times further away from us. It was not inside this 100,000 light year size galaxy. It was millions of light years away. Um, and it was, in fact, Andromeda our nearby galaxy that we now know to be a whole other galaxy separate from our own. And he went and did this in many of these smudges of light on the sky, these nebulae. Um, and, he just, and he realized that all of these smudges of light were not just smudges of light. They were entire galaxies outside our own. So this opened up this whole s discovery of this space around us full of, of these galaxies, each with perhaps 100 billion stars in them, each spinning around, each held together by their own gravity, um, each full of stars. Um, and now, this was a, that was 100 years ago, now we're able to take stunning pictures of real galaxies. This is now a real image of a galaxy um, far outside our own, um, a spiral, again, a spiral galaxy with also probably about 100,000 light years across. Um, <coughs> Again, let me just say, when I say that something is 100,000 light years, it means that its size is such that it takes light 100,000 years to cross it. 
that's our unit of measurement in astronomy. We say a light month is the distance light can travel in a month, a light year is the distance light can travel in a year. It's a useful unit of measurements because otherwise the distances get so big that you know, it fills our heads with uh, confusion. <laughs> Things just get too big to think about. Okay, so that's so we now so so we 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 now get to see these stunning galaxies around our own, and if we if we can now take, look even further, we find that um, galaxies themselves are grouped together in sort of the cosmic equivalent of towns or cities. They're either grouped together by they sort of gravity pulls them into little 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 groupings. Um, we ourselves live in quite a small grouping. We're, we live in something called the local group with just sort of three big galaxies and a whole bunch of even littler ones. Um, but there are much bigger collections of, of galaxies called clusters, which have hundreds or thousands of galaxies inside them. Um, and this is, one, this is an image of one cluster of galaxies where every one of those spots of light is an entire galaxy, fill, each filled with like 100 billion stars or so. Um, and, and, and these are among the biggest objects that we know of in space. Um, um, and so that they're, the distance even just between pairs of galaxies might be millions of light years. This might be getting on for, you know, this will be uh, tens to hundreds of millions of light years across. It's really big. <laughs> um, I haven't got an image of it, but actually what we find if we look out then with our telescopes out into the distant universe, we find it full of clusters of galaxies, the gravity pulling these gal galaxies into these groupings. Um, and actually, on an even bigger level, we find them grouped together into what we call rather unimaginatively superclusters, right? Even bigger groupings of, of groups and galaxies, groups and clusters of galaxies into these kind of mega structures, the biggest things in our universe, hundreds of millions of light years across. Um, and, and we are ourselves in the local group part of a bigger supercluster um, called the Virgo supercluster. Although there was also, we're not quite sure actually which one we're part of. There's a, we're either part of the Virgo supercluster or maybe we're part of an even bigger one called Laniarchia. Um, once you get to such big scales in the universe, it's pretty hard to determine the edges of these things. So they become a little bit more nebulous. <coughs> um, okay, and so when we really take it as far, go out as far as we can, um, we can look anywhere we want to look, in any direction in the sky we look, we just find it full of galaxies. Um, and this is just a little snapshot taken from, with a Hubble Space Telescope of a little tiny, tiny part of apparently empty space that if you stare hard enough and long enough with a telescope, it's full of galaxies. Every single spot of light is a whole galaxy. And so taken as a whole, we find the whole universe filled with the bit of the, the, bit of the universe we can see from here on Earth we find to be full of maybe a trillion galaxies, each of them with 100 billion stars or so. Just a phenomenal number. And there's no reason to think that it has to stop. There's a limit to what we can see, um, which I'll come back to, which is kind of set by how old we now think the universe is. But actually, we think it's possible. It just keeps going on and on forever in all directions. We're not, we're not sure about that. Um, so when we talk about how many galaxies there are, that's, that's just, just the part of the universe that we can see. <coughs> okay, so, so we've, got, we've got stars living in galaxies that are grouped together in these groups and clusters. Um, but, and those are the things that we see most easily with our eyes or with our telescopes in the night sky. But we can ask, you know, is that all there is? Now, this is not astronomy. <laughs> is, uh, um, let, let's imagine that we're an astronaut looking down on Earth from above, looking down at night. What do we see? We see the lights, the bright lights of the cities. And even if we couldn't make out the kind of faint, faint, um, um, faint light, the glow from the Earth, the Earth underneath, we could make out where the coastline is just by seeing where the lights are. We could figure out where the bigger cities are. Uh, we could figure out features from those lights. And a completely an astronaut from a different planet, or from a different somewhere else completely, wouldn't know what was underneath there. You know, we know that underneath there, in the darkness, are you know, the rivers, the, the, the fields, all those things that don't send out light. We know those are there because we've seen them in daytime. But an alien a creature would not know those were there at all. 
And so, you know, we can naturally ask, you know, is that kind of what might be going on out in space as well? Um, you know, are the bright lights of the galaxies all that there is? Or is there some darkness underneath? Um, and, and that's a question that was, that first came up, actually not with her, but with someone, someone before. So, so <coughs> um, back in actually 1930, um, this um, uh, uh, astronomer, Fritz Wicke, was looking at this cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster. Um, and he found something curious to be happening, which was that he found that um, the galaxies in it were zooming around inside that cluster of galaxies too fast. And that told him something interesting, because you can actually use the motion of objects to weigh something. Okay, we thought a bit about how the challenges of doing astronomy because you can't go somewhere, you can't measure somewhere, you can't, get, you can't take a meter stick and measure the distance or something. Uh, but neither can you go out into space and take your weighing scales <laughs> and weigh something out in space either. Um, so it's an interesting question is how you can actually go and weigh things out in space, um, which you might want to do to find out if there's anything uh, invisible out there. Okay. Let's imagine for a moment that we switched off the light from our sun. We would still keep going around it, right? It's the gravity of our sun that keeps our Earth orbiting around the sun. So if we suddenly switch the sun's light off, we would still go, be going around it. And, and we could tell the sun was there because we'd be zooming around it in, in, in orbit. And so this, this, this and, the, and the heavier something is, or the more massive the sun is, the faster we actually go around it. So that's Newton's law of gravity that basically says the, far, the heavier something is, the faster you'll orbit around. Okay, so the same is true for huge things in space. And so what um, uh, uh, Fritz Wicke realized was that he was looking at these galaxies moving around in this giant galaxy cluster, and they were moving too fast. And they were moving too fast given what he could see of the galaxies and their stars inside it. And so he's moving so fast that he thought that there was maybe some, um, something else in there, some invisible matter that he couldn't see that was causing them to go so fast. Um, and he wrote a paper about it um, in German where he called this um, invisible matter um, dunkel materia, um, which translates into English as dark matter. Um, and this was in 1930, um, but it was kind of promptly forgotten about because <laughs> the telescopes, telescopes around then weren't, weren't really good enough to, um, to make significant um, discoveries in this, in this area. But 30 years later, um, along comes Vera Rubin. So Vera Rubin is another one of my heroes. Um, she um, was an astronomer who actually applied to my institution, Princeton University, to do her PhD, uh, but she wasn't accepted because she was a woman, and at that time we didn't accept women graduate students. Happily we do now, um, happily things have changed. Undeterred, she went to Cornell, uh, did brilliantly, um, and then went to Georgetown and, 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 and um, made, you know, became a real expert in studying the positions of, galaxies, of, of objects in the universe and, and their, beha their behaviours as well. And this is her pictured here. And what she wants to do is to go and study how galaxies move um, very carefully. And she was going to, um, <coughs> she wanted to work out um, how fast the stars in galaxies were spinning around. So we said the galaxies live in these, these stars live in these disks, these, these disks of galaxies. Um, and, and to do this, she teamed up with her colleague, Kent Ford, to measure very carefully how fast galaxies are spinning. Now, again, I'm going to get my paper, tiny paper plate. Imagine this is a galaxy, again, and you'd like to work out how fast it's spinning around, okay? And you can do that, actually, because the light coming out of the galaxy as it spins around, uh, the light coming out from one side traveling towards you, the light, actually, its, it's wavelength of that light uh, gets squashed 
as it moves towards you. It's the Doppler effect. The same as if a, a, you see, hear a siren traveling towards you away from you, the pitch goes up or down. As a galaxy spins around, the faster it spins, the more the wavelength of this light coming towards you will get squeezed, and the more the wavelength will get stretched from the other side of the galaxy as it spins away from you. So by measuring, and, and when light's wavelength gets kind of squashed, it becomes bluer than average. That's the short wavelength end of the rainbow. The red is the long wavelength end. Um, and, and so um, you, by measuring the color of light coming from this galaxy, the stuff coming towards you, the faster it's spinning around, the more the light will get squeezed to the blue side of the light coming this way and the red side coming this way. <coughs> but to do that, you have to actually be able to look across the whole galaxy um, in detail and also split the light from the galaxy up into its wavelengths to see how fast it's moving around. And so Vera Rubin, to do this, had to work with um, uh, um, an instrument that could split light, light up into its different colors and also could see the the, these galaxies in great detail. And so what she needed to do that was the best telescope available to her at this time, which was now, which was this um, five meter Palomar telescope in, Cali in California. Um, <coughs> and she applied to use it, but she at the time was uh, um, not officially eligible because on the application form it said this is not, women cannot use a telescope. This is in the 1960s. Ridiculous. Undeterred, she, uh, she applied anyway and she actually became the first woman to get to use this, this, this enormous telescope that was, you know, the world-class telescope at the time. Um, and actually one of the reasons given that women couldn't use the telescope was there were no restrooms for women. <laughs> So silly. <laughs> um, but as the story goes, we have here from colleagues that, um, she, that Vera Rubin was so cool that she, um, she cut out a paper triangle, paper skirt, and pasted it on the symbol in the restroom. Yeah. It's like, now I have restroom. So anyway, she's awesome. So she, um, she and Kent Ford went to measure how fast all these galaxies were spinning around. And she found something incredible. At the time, it, was, you know, it seemed incredible. She had actually, at the time, that measure, old measurement of Fritz Wicke was kind of not in, not in her realization. Um, and what she found was that all of the stars and all of these galaxies were spinning much, much faster than you'd expect, given the light you could see from the stars. Um, and it wasn't just one of the galaxies. It was all of the galaxies. They were all spinning much, much too fast. And especially the stars out at the very edges of the disk of the galaxy, they were just zipping around. And again, what, would, what do we say? That the faster you move around, the more mass is pulling you. That's just Newton's law of gravity. So she saw this, and she saw all these galaxies spinning around too fast. And she realized that one explanation for it was that there was invisible mass in the galaxy, invisible stuff that you just couldn't see, but that was causing it to, to rotate, to spin around, really much too fast. Um, and then she then also realized that this was consistent with this measurement that Fritz Wicke had made 30 years before, 30 or 40 years before. And she realized that his dark matter, that, that they had in fact seen it again. Um, and they'd seen it not just in one place, but in many, many places. And so then, so what do we think a galaxy sort of really looks like? Well, this is a little cartoon. <coughs> But, but based on what you know, they observed and what we now increasingly observe, people here do that in, in great detail, we think that right at the middle of kind of a galaxy is this, is this disk of stars, the blue thing in the middle here, right? the disk of stars that we can actually see um, with some, some of the more stars around it. But then there's this huge sphere-ish of completely invisible matter around every galaxy. And it's this thing that we call dark matter. And, it, you know, and it's about 10 times heavier than the, than, the, than the stars inside that galaxy, and many times bigger across. And, it wasn't, and, and if that's, that's what you need to explain how fast the stars are spinning around. You need it to be surrounded by this whole invisible you know, sphere or halo of, of, of dark, invisible matter. Um, and we, and so it seemed to be around all these galaxies, and, and it really does still seem to be there. We really do think it's around all of these galaxies. And now if we look 
you know, take even bigger views of the, of the universe, or we try to work out in our computers what we think it looks like, which is what um, people here do a lot of, then, then we really think that underneath all those galaxies, kind of as the backbone of the universe, there's this, there's this web of completely invisible matter surrounding the galaxies, kind of linking them up in threads and beautiful, you know, th filamentary threads linking between them. Um, and, but we have no idea what it is. Um, we think it's maybe a new kind of particle that we haven't discovered yet that sort of surrounds us, could be going through us, is probably going through us right now as we speak. Um, and, and it's a complete mystery. And so we've known about it since the 1970s. And we still haven't found out what it is. Um, you know, I kind of hoped, I think many of us had hoped we'd figured it out already, but, <laughs> we, but we haven't yet. So, you know, watch this space. Perhaps uh, Risa and her colleagues will figure it out soon. Um, okay, so it's there. And so what it really does seem, and I, I can't remember what my next, yeah, it, do, it really does seem that, you know, the galaxies with their wonderful sparkling stars are just, um, are just the bright lights of this dark universe. There seems to be this invisible darkness, dark matter underneath and threading through the whole of, the whole of space. Um, and, and, it, and there seems to be many, there's much more of it than there is the, the bright lights of the stars. <coughs> so it's an interesting conundrum. There's another, one other part of our, sort of our home that I, I think is, well, it's very important and it's really exciting, I think, right now which is the planets. So we started at the very beginning by saying we've got these eight planets in orbit around our sun. But what about the other stars in the sky? Do they have planets? And, and 30 years ago, no one knew. Probably if you'd asked an astronomer, they'd probably have said, well, yeah, probably, they've probably got planets. But no one knew, because you can't see them easily from here on Earth. If you look at this night sky, you see the stars. You don't see, the planets that you can see are our planets. You can sometimes see our planets lit up by our sun and our solar system. But you don't just see planets going around other stars in the sky because planets are so tiny compared to their stars and they don't send out their own visible light. Um, so you need to come up with ways of figuring out whether planets exist around the stars in the night sky. <coughs> Luckily, astronomers you know, come, are inventive. Um, and in the past 30 years, and increasingly just in the last decade, astronomers have figured out wonderful ways of finding planets around other stars. Um, and one of, it, one of those methods has come, I'll see what this is in a minute, um, <coughs> has come from the Kepler satellite. And it finds planets in this neat way, which uses the transit method, where if I am a star, and I've got a planet going around me like this, as the planet passes in front, let me do it closer, right. As the planet passes in front of me, it dims my light a bit. I will appear a bit dimmer as the planet goes past, past the star. And if it goes around a few times, and I can look at it, and I can see it dimming a bit, then I'll be really sure that it's a planet because it will be in orbit. And every time it orbits around, it dims a little bit as it passes in front of my face, <laughs> or the star. Um, and, and using that, um, this wonderful satellite, the Kepler satellite, has found now thousands of solar systems around other stars, around us in the Milky Way. Um, this is a little snapshot, but I you know, encourage you, if you Google Kepler afterwards, like, they have this wonderful, actually animated um, image of many, many solar systems. On this little image, every circle that you see is a uh, diagram or a, a snapshot, if you will, of a whole different solar system around a different star. And each of the bright spots are a galaxy, not a galaxy, the absolute not a galaxy, a planet <laughs> going around that star. So some of them have like two or three or four or five or six of planets are going around their own star. Um, and, and I find this extraordinary because we now, from what this, these, this telescope has shown us and, and new ones are showing us too, we now think that most, if not all, the stars that we see in the night sky have their own solar systems around them. Um, and, and some of them are w really wild and wonderful. Some of them, the planets orbit in hours or days around their sun. You know, we take a whole year, 365 days, to go around our star. 
but we're finding star planets that orbit in, in you know, hours. They're like zipping around. Um, and, and that's really exciting. And it's, and, it's, and it's a huge area of astronomy right now. It's finding these new solar systems and also and trying to figure out what they look like. What, what are the planets like inside? Um, are some of them rocky? Could some of them be close enough and have the right conditions to their star to actually have life on them? And that's an enormous thing that's really underway, and it's really transformed our field. Um, and one of the places that is really of huge interest is this place called TRAPPIST-1. These are not real images of its planets, but there's this solar system that's been found just, just 40 light years from Earth, um, a solar system that has seven rocky planets going around it. Um, and you know, who knows what, what they're like and what, if there could be any life on them. So this is now one of the big questions in astronomy is can we find solar systems with planets that look like they could have life on them? Um, and to me, this is, you know, if, if many of the stars or most of them have planets, and I said we had, you know, 100 billion stars in our galaxy and like a trillion galaxies that we can even, you know, in our, the universe we can see. To me, it seems highly likely that there could be some form of life on some other planet. Um, but now it's an exciting thing is to try and go and look for it. <coughs> okay, I'm just the last, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, so we have this, that's, that's kind of our home. Let me just briefly allude to our story, okay? And I'll just take, I'll just do it, spend a little sh brief time on that. So that's our, that, that, that kind of, the universe we're living in now one of our questions is, has it always been so? Has it always been like that? And 100 years ago, Albert Einstein, pictured here on the left here, was convinced that the universe had always been as it is now, would always be the same ever forevermore, that it wasn't changing. Um, but as soon as these galaxies were found outside our own, um, and Einstein also had figured out how space itself should behave, a space that's full of galaxies. Then phys other physicists started to think about whether space could actually be changing with time. And this guy, Georges Lemaitre, who's a Belgian priest but also physicist, um, he became convinced that actually we should be living in a universe that's changing um, with time. Um, and it's a universe that could actually be growing or shrinking. And um, and Einstein didn't, didn't think this was reasonable at all. He thought this was ridiculous. Um, but, but this guy, Georges Lemaitre, was pretty convinced. And he said, no, look, I think that if we scatter galaxies throughout space, that space should either be shrinking or growing as time passes. It shouldn't just stay there still doing nothing. And we can think of it a little bit like, and I'll just show you this and then we'll, we'll wrap up, that uh, <laughs> well, let's think of it a bit like this model universe. <laughs> okay, this is my model universe. I did actually manage to bring this from New Jersey. It's a bit smaller than a saucepan lid. Um, imagine that you are living, an ant living in a universe where your space is just this piece of elastic um, and the stickers on it are galaxies. And, and imagine that you are living in a space and you were trying to work out if that space were growing or shrinking or just staying the same forevermore. And I can kind of model that in one dimension by just pulling this piece of elastic. If I pull the elastic, the galaxies in it move apart. And if the universe is shrinking, the galaxies move together. And so Lemaitre over here said, I think the universe should either be doing this or should be doing this. And Einstein thought, no, no, it's not doing anything at all. It's just staying still. And so there was this big um, uh, discovery that happened just, it was around in, in just in the late 1920s where a combination of Lemaitre and then Edwin Hubble looked at all these galaxies around us that we now had discovered were entire galaxies around our own. And they discovered that, in fact, all the galaxies around us, on average, are moving away from us, which is what you would predict in a universe that is gradually growing. In a universe that's gradually growing, any, un any galaxy you choose to live in will appear to see galaxies move away from it if the universe is growing. Um, and so Edwin Hubble um, and George Lemaitre looked at the galaxies around our own and actually discovered that, yes, they were moving away from us. And, and that's a one, that was wonderful proof that the universe is actually growing, but also this kind of wonderful realization that if you wind time backwards, 
A universe that's growing now must have started growing at some point in the past. And so you can wind time back very far and imagine a time in the deep past when space began to grow and began to grow from kind of almost nothing or even, you know, perhaps zero size, but let's just think of a small size, and began to grow suddenly. And this sudden growth is this thing that we call the Big Bang, the beginning of the growth of space. And by looking at how the galaxies move around us, we've now come to estimate that that happened about 14 billion years ago. The 14 billion years ago, space began to grow, um, and, and, and it's been growing ever since. And so we are living in it, you know, 14 billion years later, and we on Earth, we think, have been here for only, only about 5 billion years of that. We think our sun was born about 5 billion years ago, um, with the planets slowly forming around it. Um, and so we're kind of here at this, this, this time. Um, and, and anyway, there's a, there's a lot more of our story to tell, but, um, but, I, but I'm going to stop there. So, so yeah, we, we, we found out so much about our universe, but we have so many questions that we're still waiting to answer. Um, and I think, you know, I won't get to answer them all, but, you know, maybe, maybe you know, for future people, <laughs> people here will get to answer them. I'll stop there. Thank you. We have time for some questions. And uh, Maria's going to help with the mic, so. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just wondering about um, what your thoughts and other astronomers of that Umau Mau or um, oh, yeah. meteor or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are, there are two, two views. Um, one is it's an alien, and one is it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not. <laughs> um, OK, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think, I think um, there, are, there are speculations that it's you know, come, been sent in as an alien spaceship or something. Um, I think that's probably less likely than some more realistic um, studies of like, how this thing could have formed in, in a more uh, not mundane, but more, more in your normal way. So actually, a colleague, some of our colleagues down at, um, not down there, I think you're down at, over in Space Telescope, have been saying that actually it's quite reasonable that you could, you could make this object without it needing to be an alien, alien life form. So, you know, it's a fun idea, but I, I suspect that it's, there's, a more, there's a simple explanation for it. Um, when, when you showed the, uh, the band of stars from the Milky yeah. Way that we see in the sky, Yeah. Um, if you look at the disk and mm. look at where we're at, yeah. how far out from where we are are we actually able to see? When we're looking at that band in the sky, how far, how oh, much yeah, that, of the Milky Way are we seeing? That's a good question, yeah. So we, so we are a bit limited by the fact that the reason actually that it gets dimmed quite a lot is that there's actually dust grains in our, in our galaxy um, that are blocking some of that sun and starlight. So, we're, by our eyes aren't, aren't, for example, able to see to the middle of the galaxy. We're just we're seeing the stars that are that are close around us in the disk. And I, the stars that we can see with our eyes, I actually don't don't I don't recall like exactly how far it is around us. But it's not super far because the dust is blocking some of that light. We could see much further if it wasn't doing that. Yeah. This, this one first, and then. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is there any oxygen or nitrogen gas on the on the it, the Trappist Eleven solar system? So, so we don't know yet what's there. So it's 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 really fascinating. It's going to be the target of of many follow up observations that will be looking for atmospheres around it. Um, and so people are starting to look, but people are going to be able to do a better job with upcoming telescopes. I think it's going to be an enormous focus of new telescopes, and in particular, they will be looking to say which elements can we see in the atmospheres. And you said so it's 40, year, 40 light years away. Yeah, 40. So it's not it's not that it's one of the closest. So the nearest stars to us is four, four light years, so it is a really it is pretty close to us. If we could invent like light light speed transport technology. The Proxima Centauri, that's about 4.2 light years away, we could probably get there within our lifetime. And then the, the, uh, 
the Trappist 11 system yeah. as well. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I think we would have to figure that out, this, this very fast light travel, so that's, it's a good challenge. Um, and, and actually, um, but I think also even Proxima Centauri, we now think has got a, you know, got a planet around it as well. So maybe not as many, but, but yeah. So, so I, I think there's still a lot of technology to figure out to go that fast, but um, you know, one, we should think big, think big. Right here, um, you showed a slide uh, showing a, a model distribution of the dark energy around the galaxy, and it was you know, looked more or less spherical. Yeah. I just wonder in the uh, how much uncertainty is there in the in the data to allow for much more exotic distributions of dark matter? Because you know, just historically, the first thing you assume is a sphere, and yeah. then that's wrong. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. That's a very good question. Actually, so the, the the expert answer to this is, is just standing over there. But uh, we 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 now what we what we do to fi to figure out what we th there's two things we can try and infer what shape it has um, through looking at looking at it sort of directly, and I'll just explain in a minute how. Or we can also in our computers uh, simulate how we think it looks, and there are beautiful simulations now done by Risa and others here that kind of show how we think it clumps together. And it's not a perfect sphere, right? It's kind of like spherical-ish with like bits sticking off it. And so, and so when you, so yeah, it's, 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 it's imperfect. Filamentary. Yeah, exactly, that's right. It, it is filamentary, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but that's on larger scales than what she showed. Yeah. Sure. So. The slide up there says there are still so many questions, but that sort of implies that the number of questions is static. I mean, <laughs> have the astronomers plotted the number of questions that? that <laughs> Probably. I mean, exponentially increased. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's science. That's just that's knowledge, right? I mean, I, 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 wouldn't it be awful if we ran out of questions? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think the more we know, the more questions we will ask. So, so. I mean, it's wonderful to keep learning, but I think we will keep asking questions. Now, there is a bit of a fundamental limit with astronomy, which is the limit of what we can physically see. So that we will have some questions that we will never be able to answer because we just can't access the part of space that could tell us the answer. You know, we can only see out to places that light has had time to reach us since the beginning of the growth of the universe. So anything further than that is beyond our reach, but it's not going to be beyond our questions. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, again, I, I'm 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 not disheartened by always having more questions. I think that's just. <laughs> so if the universe is expanding, what is what's the space that it's expanding into, and what was in that new space before the universe expanded into it? This is a good question. So this is where I will return a little bit to my my model universe, which is doesn't which doesn't have all the answers because it does actually have edges. So. Um, we think that the universe doesn't have any edges. And I'll tell you two ways, and oh, sorry, my galaxy just fell off. Um, <laughs> two ways, let, let's go back to one dimensional space. Imagine this is space, this piece of elastic, and you can only w move in one dimension along it. We think that the universe is either infinitely long, such that this piece of elastic just does literally stretch infinitely far in this direction and this direction, or we think it's wrapped up like this, right? Where you go out in one direction and you will come back the other direction if you travel far enough. Now the real universe is three dimensional, so we think it behaves a little bit like if I had this elastic in three dimensions, like this way and this way and this way. And again, we think that those three dimensions either stretch infinitely far or they are wrapped up on themselves. You go out in any direction, you'll come back to where you started. And we don't think the universe is growing from somewhere. We think it's growing everywhere. Again, like the elastic, if I stretch it, the growth happens everywhere in that space. There isn't a middle to it. And so we imagine that as the universe grows, it, just, it is getting bigger. But as it's either infinitely big or it's, or it's contained and wrapped up in some finite size. And so there isn't an edge for that to, to go out beyond. Now, there's obviously, there's still the question of, yeah, what is, is it in some bigger space, some higher dimensional space? And I just, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but what is true is that we do not think of it as having edges or a middle. We think of it as just being, stretching on, um, you know, forever. 
Um, do all the galaxies have a black hole in the middle? And if the answer is no, uh, what percentage would have a black hole? That's a really good question and super topical for the beautiful image we saw just a couple of weeks ago of the black hole of our neighboring galaxy. Yeah, so we think probably yes. We think that, um, or at least big ones, big galaxies like, like ours, um, they um, likely all have a supermassive, a giant black hole at their core. Now, there are going to be very small galaxies that won't have, that smaller much smaller ones that, wouldn't, that we don't think have them. Um, but um, on average, a big, a big sort of regular-sized galaxy like our own, we think, yes, they, they do have them in them. And one thing that's wonderful that we're waiting for, so w look out for this, I think, probably the next few years, is galaxies merge together nearby ones. So far away ones spread apart, but really close ones actually merge together, combine together. We're going to collide with Andromeda in about five billion years and <laughs> make it, <laughs> that's an example, and make a big new galaxy. When they do that, and this happens all the time in space, they're giant black holes, we think, spiral around together and collide and, and make a big new one. And when that happens, we think they send out gravitational waves, ripples in space time. And we are waiting for that signal. We've seen tiny black holes. I mean, it's amazing, from LIGO, <laughs> like, spiraling around. That's a brilliant. But we are waiting for new measurements, I think probably in the next five years, maybe, of these galactic big black holes colliding. So yeah, watch, watch out for it. Is there a theory about us being a little bit more humble towards the universe? Like, uh, fr from what you describe when you say visible or invisible, that, in fact, depends on some wavelength. Wh what you describe expanding or not expanding, that depends on, you know, sp speed and another wavelength, right? So maybe we're like uh, blind people seeing an elephant from different angles, right? So yeah. the universe is just being, and maybe there are a large number of things we are missing from being able to detect what's happening, right? Yeah. No, do you know what I, I, th I mean? In the bigger view, like, yeah, it's, you know, we can only see what we can see. And we, we, there's dark matter we see just indirectly. And, and, and I, in a, bigger, in a bigger sort of sense, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't think it's, I wouldn't be completely surprised if we have, like, you know, a big paradigm shift to come that could explain why we think there's all this invisible stuff and what it is. Um, that we have big enough questions that we, we could have got some big things wrong. You know, we, we think that we've made sense of what we can see, but if you look back on, you know, history of science, uh, you know, we probably haven't got it all right yet, and we might have got something really big wrong. So, I, let's see. <laughs> yeah. uh, one there, and then uh, you can ask your question, and then I'm hoping that somebody, one of the youngsters in the room, will, will ask a question. So, <laughs> think about it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this is two mundane questions. Mm -hmm. One, why don't you like Hubble with a pipe, and why can't you Photoshop him out if you really don't uh. like the pipe? <laughs> it's, I'm worried for his health. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not healthy. <laughs> you could Photoshop him out. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how do we know that there wasn't another Big Bang, like infinitely far away? Oh, we don't know that. And so actually one, one possibility of even our sort of the bigger universe is that, you know, our, we think for some reason, I didn't really get to explain why because I don't also know why, but we think that our, the universe we can see around us, that it did begin growing suddenly 14 billion years ago. And something made it suddenly begin to expand and suddenly begin to, begin to grow. We don't yet know what did that. But what we do think is possible is that the thing that did start our bit of space growing to make the space the bigger space around us now. It could have started at a slightly different time, very far away um, in the universe. And so it could have there the big sort of it's the big bang of a place very far away could have actually begun before or after ours. It could have happened at a different time. Um, so there's that possibility <laughs> that you could have lots of different kind of it ends up being like this multiverse of lots of different kind of universes together. There's also another kind of intriguing possibility that there could have been big bangs in the past. You know, we could be, there could have been a big bang and then uh, space either, you know, could have stretched apart and then it could have started expanding again or it could have, uh, other things could have happened. So people really think about these, these possibilities. We, we don't know. Um, a question on scope, similar to your talk. Uh, there's continuing trickle of new verifications of general relativity. Could you place within the size and time frames you've been talking about 
the applicability of those uh, verifications and any questions beyond the applicability that people may be raising about whether general relativity is suitable? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So we do think, you know, when we talk about how things behave in the universe, we're assuming that Einstein's law of gravity of general relativity is true um, and that it describes the motion of everything. Um, now, there's a few um, beautiful examples. I mean, this, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you an exam example of where we use general relativity in what comes out to be this beautiful way, which is one of the ways we see the invisible matter in the universe, the dark matter, is because of the gravitational bending of light around it. So if there was a big dark matter lump in between you and I, and I was the source of light, right, I'd send out light to you, and it would bend around the light to you. And that bending is actually described by Einstein's theory of general relativity, how much it bends and how we see it. And so we are now able to see that bending, and it, again, what we see fits perfectly with what Einstein's theory predicts. Um, in another way, we've seen these wonderful black holes colliding and then sending ripples out in space-time, that those ripples are, again, the result of what we predict from general relativity. Um, and so from the, from the kind of, and we, so from the, from, the, from the very small scale to large scale, everything we're seeing so far is consistent and we keep keeping, and again, the, 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 circular, the circular black spot of the, of the black hole at the middle of the, that, that, that galaxy that we saw, the fact that it was this perfect circle or this perfect you know, hole was, again, testing it. So we've been testing it in all different ways, but we don't know that it's completely right everywhere. And one of the mysteries we have right now, which I didn't even get to talk about, is that actually the growth of space seems to be speeding up faster and faster. Um, and, and we invoke something that's called a vacuum energy, an energy of empty space. But people are really exploring whether, again, that apparent behavior could be something to do with general relativity not being right. So, so far, we can't find anything that breaks it. It seems to be doing great. But people are certainly still looking for areas where they could tweak it. It's hard. It seems to be hard to do. Um, oh. What? What? Um, so now that people are able to determine the number of planets there are in different solar um, mm -hmm. systems, are people noticing patterns? Like, is there a limit to the number of planets that you can have based on the size of a sun? And then also, can you determine patterns about the type of planets that you would have? Yeah, that's a really good question. So tons is being discovered about these things. So, so the, there, this is this is this is kind of a, a growing and burgeoning field. So I don't have all the answers for you right now. But yeah, there's. There have been planets, solar systems with maybe up to you know seven or eight planets discovered, but there may be many more. We just haven't been able to see them yet in the solar systems. Um, so um, and and people are seeing sort of different kinds of planets around, also different numbers of planets around different stars or different closenesses to the to the stars. But I think what's what's probably been the most surprising is how different so many of the solar systems are to ours. Like again, ones where they're very the planets are really really close. Um, or, um, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, um, sorry, what was I going to say? <laughs> okay, I, had, I had a point to make, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, so different, and then, but then, and then, and then also learning about things like how the planets are ordered. So one of the things that we're kind of, we've learned from this all is that we think probably now that our planets themselves were ordered in a different way in the past, like Jupiter probably wasn't where it was in the past. And that's something that we've learned from looking at the solar systems. So yeah, I haven't got all the answers. I'm not an exoplanetist myself, but like there are, there are uh, just from seeing so many, yeah, we're learning a huge amount. Um, what is the reasoning behind the uh, hypothetical, like cyclical theory, like, like, con con like the universe contracting after yeah. it, it expands? So there's a couple. So, so I think there's, there's a generic appeal actually to the idea of a cyclic universe where you have like contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. It's kind of, kind of nice. It's more, com in a way, it's more comfortable than things just happening infinitely big once off, whatever. Um, there's two possibilities for what such a universe could be. You could imagine our universe is, is growing and then would stop growing and would shrink again and then would grow and then shrink. At the moment, that doesn't seem to be how our universe is behaving because we, for some reason, seem to see our universe growing faster and faster, which would imply that it's not going to turn back around and shrink. 
So that kind of sort of one version of a cyclic universe doesn't seem to work so well with what we observe. But there are people studying alternatives where you know the universe can grow apart and then a new bang can happen, and maybe you could have a you could have a shrinking universe that then. So yeah, you could you could you could imagine in, our, in the future our universe shrinking and then growing again. But again, what we what we see right now doesn't look consistent with just a kind of a simple shrinking to a big crunch and then banging again. But but yeah, there's lots of ex. Let me go back. One of the reasons people like to explore it as well is to try and explain why the Big Bang happened in the first place. So there's this, there's this, there's this model at the moment called the Big Bounce, or bouncing cosmology, where you say that instead of just starting from nothing, you had a kind of a shrinking universe and then bounced out into a Big Bang. So it's possible. Um, I've heard that black holes and... Um, the Big Bang have a lot of similar characteristics, mm. and that there's like an idea or concept that um, that the Big Bang is a black hole, or that we're living in a black hole. So, what's your opinion on that? It's a really good question. So, this, there's this kind of phenomenal thing that I well I find amazing, which is inside a black hole we don't have the physics to describe what happens at the middle of it even though we know we've now seen it sort of almost up close right we've seen it almost to the inside of a black hole but that black hole we just saw recently we think that you know it's it's something billions of times the mass of our sun squeezed into a space of zero size mm -hmm. now that's our physics doesn't work at that point it breaks down we don't actually have the ability to describe that we say yeah yeah it's all squeezed down to infinite size or singularity but we, our laws of physics genuinely don't tell us what happens at that point. And in the same way, the Big Bang is the same kind of problem where if I imagine reversing the growth of space down to zero size, I imagine putting the whole of the universe in a zero size space. Again, I call it a singularity, but really I call it a problem, right? Because I don't know what happens there. So the same problem happens inside a black hole and at the Big Bang where, um, if we extrapolate things to that very core of the black hole or to the very beginning of the universe, our laws of physics simply cannot describe them currently. So we kind of think of them as similar because the same problem happens and we probably think that like an, an enhancement of our current understanding of physics could explain both things. Um, uh, whether we're living at the middle of a black hole, we, I, I sort of think not because I would then be infinitely squashed. Um, <laughs> um, but whether, but I, but I do think that the similarity of this, of this, of what's inside, what those two, those two things are, yeah, of huge interest, and we just need some new physics to explain it. Okay, quick one, and then so, we have one in the front, okay. and you're going to be the last one. Go ahead. All right, uh, I'm glad there's a little kid on board. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, in lieu, well, is your, is your um, elastic tape measure made of? Space or space-time? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> it's made of space. <laughs> um, but no, it's made of space. If I was to be modeling it correctly, it's made of space-time. And I'll actually just tell you a simple, simple, so space-time is a funny, funny word. And so we, Einstein tells us that like, the existence of mass in space distorts time. So what is true about my elastic, even though you don't notice it very much, is that time actually passes a little bit differently for someone living at the edge of the sticker than someone living over here. Because the being near a big, big mass makes time pass differently. And, this is, and, and so this, this connection of the fact that like, your experience of space and your experience of time depend on like, the mass that's distorting the space you're living in does couple it together. So yeah, this it it, it is both, um, but it's this it's this idea that like that both time and space are affected by putting big masses in into space into yeah into space. All right, last question up here in the front. Uh, so um, what what about dark radiation? I heard about that somewhere. I just I really don't know what it is, but I heard something about it. Yeah, so we, as astronomers, we come up with, we, we call things that we don't understand, like dark something. <laughs> so, um, so, so it's part the, because there are these features that we don't get, like there is this invisible matter, there is this ex accelerating expansion of space that we don't understand, and, there's a and there are some other mysteries that, 
um, that we don't know whether there are other things that we can't see coming into the day of, you know, what, what else could there be that's invisible? So people have come up with this idea also of dark radiation, which could be a little bit like the light we see, but actually invisible to us. Um, and, and it's um, it's not something that we, we think is, is definitely there. We're more convinced that dark matter is there. Um, but, but while we continue to have all this invisible stuff that we haven't explained, we sometimes come up with these new ideas and say, can I, can I rule it out or could it possibly be an explanation? Um, so, um, yeah, we, ba we, need, we need to make, need to look, look a bit harder and see if any of this stuff is really there. Quick all question. right, thank you. Let's, uh, let's thank Joe again. And we don't have any books with us, but if you brought Joe's book and you want her to sign it, she, she will. <laughs>